Okay, so why don't we get started now? So welcome, welcome everyone. I hope you all have a chance to look at the agenda. It has been posted now to the chat. You are uh, welcome to, to print it out or just refer to it while we're um, doing our, throughout our meeting. And what we're going to be doing today is we're going to have a really special um, presentation by some wonderful GANIC members. But we'll get started with um, any, any new business anyone would like to address. You can drop that into the chat if anyone has new business. Otherwise, we will just um, go with the agenda as is. All right. No new business? Okay, I don't see anything there. All right, so great. So welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our April meeting. It's a beautiful spring day. I hope everyone is going outside. I hope everyone is enjoying the gorgeous, the gorgeous weather and that you're also um, working. I keep running into guides. It is really every single day I see guides up at the observatory and it's really, really very, very exciting. It's really um, a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. So I'm very excited for that. I'm really happy to see people out and about. I'm happy to see that people are so busy and these are kind of you know, problems we're glad to have again. <laughs> the boats are too crowded going to the Statue of Liberty. I got six, over 6,000 people showing up at One World Observatory and they're all talking to me at the same time some days, it seems like. So it's really, these are really, really great problems to have after, um, you know, so we've gone through so much. I mean, I have to say, I feel, I kind of feel like um, we're, we're back to normal in, in, in so many ways with tourism and I'm not quite sure what to do with it. So that's, that's also a, hat, it's a happy problem to have. And so that also means, um, you know, be aware, be aware of the other guides, be aware of your fellow guides, you know, best practices when guiding. If you had groups before when things were still really, really very slow, you may have taken up the whole sidewalk or, you know, stood too close to an entry or an exit. So just be mindful of that and be mindful of your fellow guides. I think my problem is whenever I see a guide who's out guiding and I'm with my group, I just want to tackle them and give them a big hug. So I get a little over exuberant, but that's really, it's great to see everybody out and about um, once again. So a couple of things that have happened over the, um, over the past few weeks, we had a very, very successful um, committee con, the committee uh, meeting, thanks to Kevin Lawrence, also Kit Garrett, she's unfortunately not at the meeting tonight, but really Kevin Lawrence, it was his idea, he brought it together, he brought all these committees together, and it was great. I mean, it was really, really, I think a lot of fun. It was a really good way to see and hear from all our committee chairs and to give members, especially new members, a chance to get to know um, the committees, to know what they do and to get to know their chair people and to um, get ready to sign up and to participate. Now, if you missed it and you want to join a committee, We'll put in the chat the direct link on our GANIC website. Okay, on the GANIC website, it's very easy. You just go to the GANIC page and you can just see right there, um, the, the right up at the top under the about, it says contact information for committees. And you can find it right there. It's super easy and you can just contact everybody right away. So, you know, that's something that we all encourage you to do if you have not um, joined a committee. That's what keeps Gannett going. I'll sometimes get um, comments or questions from other guys associations and they say, how does Gannick do so much? How do you do so much? And I said, well, it's not just me. It's not just the board. It's all our committees and it's all our members who are such fantastic volunteers and who really do all the heavy lifting and do so much. And so you can do as much as you'd like. You can do as little as you like. So we really encourage you, though, to join some of our committees. Now, um, one announcement I would like to, to make, we did send an email about this, and this is about COVID, um, COVID requirements. GANIC will be following the COVID restrictions, and I'm sorry, I was looking for the actual language for it. I don't have it with me right hand. GANIC will be following the COVID requirements for the venues that we use, okay? When we are attending an event and we're attending in a venue, if they have COVID rules set in place, those are the rules we must follow. Otherwise, 
we do not have COVID restrictions, just like the key for New York City, for NYC has been lifted. You no longer have to show your VAX card. Um, you no longer have to be masked in some places. The same kind of thing with GANIC. That being said, we highly encourage everyone, if you haven't gotten your booster yet, get your booster. If you, know, if you haven't gotten vac vaccinated yet, um, there's no time like now, so you can please do that. And it's really for everyone's safety and for our city's safety and for, of course, your safety and your health as well. So we really encourage that. We encourage you to get your booster. But once again, we will follow the rules according to the different venues. So if we go to a venue and they require masks and they require proof of vaccine, that's the rule we have to follow. OK, so those will always um, take precedence over everything else. All right. And um, the other things I want to mention, uh, the next meeting in May will not be the first Wednesday. It will be the second Wednesday in May at Roosevelt Island. OK, we'll be meeting out on Roosevelt Island. So please um, keep your eyes open for more information about that. When um, when it comes around, you'll be receiving the regular invitation to the Roosevelt Island meeting. And so that will be on Wednesday. May 11th, okay, not May 4th, even the board, we got ourselves in a little tangle about that. So, um, so that will be on May 11th out on Roosevelt Island. It will also be a slightly earlier, we will be at the Roosevelt Island, Island Library. So do make sure to mark your calendars, the meeting will be starting at 530, okay, instead of the usual six o'clock. So that's just a little heads up um, that we'll be meeting, that we'll be meeting there. So um, we're going to have a really great meeting tonight. Uh, we'll have our wonderful authors from the Gannett Community Plus report um, on Destination Capitol Hill from our Government Relations Committee. Committee. Um, but for now, I'm going to pass over to Kevin Lawrence, our vice president, who has a few words to say, and then he'll be also introducing the next portion. So take it away, Kevin. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you all tonight. Well, thank you, Emma, and uh, welcome and good evening, everyone. I just wanted to take a few just brief moments and hope that, and I'm sure you all will uh, join me in congratulating our own president, Dr. Emma Gas Gonzalez, and our colleague and friend on winning a uh, City Guide Award for uh, the Women in Tourism for 2022. Um, I think it's a great testament to all of the great talent for that this was set up by American Airlines and City Guide to, to honor all of the women who are involved in tourism here in New York City. So it's just a great to see a representative of Emma, and I think it's a nice holdover for, I guess every month should be Women's Month, right? Women's History Month. But uh, today we have this great uh, talented group of women uh, members who are gonna be sharing with it. But I wanted to just congratulate Emma. I think that there's a big luncheon that's coming up in May mm -hmm. that she's going to be part of. And so <laughs> congratulations, Emma. Thank um, you all. And thank you to the board for nominating me. It was really, really an honor. And it's my pleasure to be working for all of you guys. So thank you guys. Well, well-deserved. Okay, and so I'm gonna hand everything over to our other very talented uh, Lifetime Spirit Award, I forget the actual name, but Nina Mendez. And so Nina, you can uh, take it from here. Yeah, so uh, tonight we're, we're doing a program on guides who write or write, writers who guide. And uh, we have three wonderful women who have a long, been members for a long time, Gannick, and who've written in different genres. Uh, Betty Rosen, who does 20, uh, celebrating a 40 year anniversary writing children's books. Uh, Peggy Taylor, who just did a wonderful photography book called Streeteries about the outdoor dining experience during the pandemic in New York City. And then Sheila Evans, who's done Cathedral Parkway Towers at Harlem's Gate. It, it's a sort of an oral history documentary, uh, nonfiction book uh, about an apartment building in New York. And, it's a wonderful book. So uh, we're going to jump in and start with Betty because uh, she's been celebrating her birthday all week and she has <laughs> tickets to a show. So uh, I'm going to introduce her with a, a very brief uh, professional author's bio, but she's also worked in the travel industry for a long time. Uh, Betty Rosen is a Brazilian writer living in the United States who has completed a literary career of 40 years in which she has published approximately 
20 books of children's literature and poetry. Betty has won several awards, including the Brazilian International Press Award in the United States and the Best of Brazil Global Award for Children's Literature by London's high profile magazine. She also received now the Machado de Assis Medal by the Brazilian Endowment for the Arts in New York. And she was just telling us how to pronounce this, so you can correct me, Betty. So uh, she's going to be presenting uh, a sort of a PowerPoint of her work. Uh, thank you. Um, let me um, have to share the oh, technology here. One moment. I didn't click the share thing. Let me do the chef. Oh, okay. I I okay with this. With the, I see. I just want to confirm if you are. Uh, no, that's good. That's great. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, it's a pleasure be to be invited. I'm kind of tense to say. <laughs> I have to say forty years and. 10 minutes, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, um, I'm very uh, testy here, my PowerPoint, one minute. Let me start the beginning. Uh, I started uh, my first book, these are my four, four books. My first book was Bola de Sabão, Soap Bubbles, was published in 1982 in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, is, uh, uh, is only poetry. And I started writing for children in 1984. One happened, um, a boom of children's literature in Brazil. Uh, I started with Robinho, Robozinho, Outras Histórias. The third book was Tancredo Neves. Tancredo Neves was elected president, but he died before he, he, he could work as a president. So it's for children. Tancredo Neves, gente, para gente lembrar e relembrar. In my book, Diário de uma Jovem Israel, a diary of a young woman in Israel, is about my life in Israel, was published in 1988. And after this, I came to the United States and uh, I created with Peter Hayes, uh, Sem Fronteiras Press, uh, a publishing company. And uh, we wrote, uh, uh, we, our first book was uh, in 1994, published here. In United States, when I start uh, working as a tour guide, uh, my license, 1994, and I published this book. This is a publishing companies that uh, we sold our rights or you do partnership. For example, our books were published by Editora do Brasil and Line Publish. In Colombia, we have Spanish, English, Portuguese books that you can have an idea. This is a book that was uh, three editions, uh, Heart Alone in the Land of Darkness. We have an edition in Portuguese and English. He had one bilingual that was published in 1994 and is not uh, sold out. This is a book about a heart that is in search for a owner in the land of darkness. Nobody had a heart. And, uh, but it was written in the time of the Gulf War. So we have some inspiration with Saddam Hussein, with the calculator man that only thinks about uh, money, 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 the materialism, and it, it's for children, for adults, this, no? This is a Stony Spirit, it was in English and Portuguese. I wrote together with Peter Hayes, it's about the uh, Guarani Indians. It's, it's in the time of discovery of Brazil under the point of view of indigenous. Uh, uh, this is uh, about immigrant that is inspiring myself and a little bit my son is without words, is a Brazilian immigrant boy trying to adapt to the United States. Uh, we work with the very famous Brazilian illustrators, Daniel Azulay, Graça Lima, Eliado França. So you have beautiful illustrations. This one was published in Colombia, in Spanish, in Portuguese, in Brazil. Uh, it's for children, too. It's about uh, based in the, in the stuffed animal that my, our son lost. And uh, we create a story, Peter and I, we create a story based in this stuffed animal, frog. 
This is that Annabelle. Annabelle is a, a child on the way. Um, is about a, a, a child in the before was born here in this world, in the spiritual world, before. It's very spiritual, this, uh, this uh, book. And these, we have three editions. This is about my family. We have an edition in English, Portuguese, and Spanish, two continents for generations. It's based in my family that left Brazil in 1939. My father, the two sisters, my grandmother, yeah, that, that's his mother, yeah, and uh, went to Rio de Janeiro. And they have my, uh, my son that, uh, uh, that is the other generation, the fourth generation. Uh, happening and is a fiction work, is a novel, but it's based in the interview that uh, I interviewed my aunt. Now she passed away with 97 years old, but she did, she crossed uh, from Poland to Brazil in uh, uh, na, uh, when she was 16 years old. Um, this is most recent books, is poetry. I came back to poet, Cibola Sabon was the first. This is the most recent that uh, I have a poem since the 80s, the 1980s, until the uh, nowadays. It's like a, it's bilingual Portuguese English, my passage in this world. The most recent book is in Portuguese, Gato que Gato em Pino Rabo, is also for children, this one. Uh, this is uh, uh, my, that you can have an, a visual idea about uh, the books that uh, I publish. And uh, you also you have an influence in, in, the, in my life as an immigrant in the United States. And uh, also you have all the stories very, uh, with different inspirations. Not only the, uh, uh, some inspire in my experience and some in the experience of my family or some are very uh, or fiction. Né? Um, I don't know if you, you, you have, uh, if you do like to, I prefer to ask questions about uh, my career because I try to limit in few minutes my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I was kind of stressed if I passed the time. I don't know how many minutes I have here, but. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, well, and the, what happened that uh, I work in different areas I, uh, as a tour guide, I'm a Ganic uh, member, I think since 1995 or 96, and my license was in 94. And, uh, and uh, yeah, right since 1982, that my first book. And uh, he, of course, that uh, get, uh, the tour guide has influenced many things. For example, even if I'm not tour guide, but I always travel. I work for an airline. I'm a retired from an airline. And I always travel all over the world. And uh, this, of course, give me a lot of experience. And it, it, it took continents for generations. I went to Poland. And, uh, and I, I did the same way that my family did when they left the small town of Piaski near Lublin. And uh, in the, oh, we, I did all this trip and, uh, and I also interviewed my aunt. So I could have uh, an idea how to write this book based on the experience that happened there, plus fiction, eh? because I work with the fiction. Yeah, I created this publishing company, Sem Fronteiras Press, uh, that we do things connect to the Brazil. So I still promote Brazil here, I work with Brazilian tourists, with Portuguese, Portugal too, with the Portuguese, but I also work with the Spanish, with, his, with the Latin people that come from uh, different countries. And so all my work is kind of international. <laughs> it's more like that. Yeah, I also have adaptation of books, for example. I have a adaptation of my first book uh, for children, Robinho uh, Robozinho, Tempo de Brincadeira was adapted for theater, for a play. It was uh, in, um, produced in 1987 in Brazil, this one. This one was translated, the first story, to Chinese and to Hebrew. Chinese uh, was, pub was uh, published in a magazine for children 
in China, in, in Israel, in Hebrew too. And uh, so I have uh, my work in different languages, not only books like uh, Spanish, English, Portuguese, but also I have some anthologies that I work with the different Brazilian writers or international writers that I, 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 I have in French translation and Italian too. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I, I have different type of uh, languages, my work. Yeah, I, I used to go to many international book fairs and I have partnership with the different uh, publishing companies too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think we have a question, Kevin. I don't, I don't see that Matt Baker has a question, but we. Well, yeah. yeah um, so, Betty, Matt Baker asked that he noticed in the Portuguese language edition of your book about the heart had an illustration of the New York City skyline. So, is yeah. the book set? Is the book set in New York City, or are some of your other books set in New York City? No, you know that not. For example, I don't know why my first book, The Illustrator, put the Statue of Liberty like that. I didn't even think about to leave the United States when he did. The Illustrator, they create what I think about. And they, they decide to put this, maybe it's kind of freedom. It's about the freedom. I was worried about the feelings, about the reason and the feelings and the... Depends on the interpretation of the, the illustrator. For example, Heart Alone in the Land of Darkness is funny because it's New York City. But the illustrator, Gracia Lima, she lives in Rio de Janeiro. Actually, she, she was born the same day, month, and year than myself. It's a coincidence. And uh, she created this because she thinks that maybe uh, many people Immigrants, Brazilian immigrants, for example, they think about, wow, we live in this land in New York. New York is, is a tough city. Maybe, for example, it's nothing to do. I didn't say the word in New York City in the book, but it's, everything is symbolic. It's mm -hmm. like that, that the heart that thinks about only, uh, he wants to, to enter into the, into the chest of a human being. Uh, in the calculator, I mean, I only think about money, money, money. Maybe because she felt that New York, People think about money. This is the, the, the view of the Brazilian illustrator. Eh? Mm -hmm. It's funny because it was New York City. Eh? Oh, and also, yeah, it's about you have a t uh, different characters there. TV woman, TV man, TV. And we have a, a child, you have a, a poet. I have a character mm -hmm. of a poet too. It's very symbolic. It can be any city, but... It happens that was inspired. The, the, the illustrator was inspired in, in, because I live here, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So you, you've you been doing this for 40 years uh, uh, between writing and publishing. So what, um, what, what inspired you initially to get into children's books? What, what yeah. about children's books compared to other writing? Yeah, I always like, I always was a poet. I, I love poetry. And, uh, and the, but I said, poet, I don't have a market. And I had a, a very uh, good friend, writer. He was writing poetry and children's books. And he had advised me, why you don't write for children? What was the boom of children's literature in Brazil in the 1980s? And, uh, um, and the, also I thought that I could put poetry, I put could put uh, my child out. I could create more imagining. I like the world of a child. I, I, I was like uh, putting myself as a child writing a story. I could have more imagination, feelings. And so for me, I always write, I always was connected with children, always. Yeah. I work with children with creative writing program in New York public schools and the and I did, my, my books were uh, used in the schools in Brazil, in Colombia, United States. And uh, I, yeah, I always visit the schools. I love to deal with the kids. This is, I really like this. After, of course, I was inspired by my son, but he's now 24, 25 years old. He's gonna be 25, but when he was a child, of course. But I usually put myself as a child. I was inspired about these children's, uh, a um, world, world, <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. And one more thing before we move on, uh, uh, Betty, uh, what uh, you mentioned, uh, so how does your tour guiding inspire your writing or photography? I mean, your, your children's books, is there? Um... Yeah, I mentioned before that I always travel and I observe things around me to write, of course, the experience of dealing with the people, we are dealing with the people also from Brazil, from other countries. You also give me inspiration, of course. No? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like that uh, even before you see that this book about Israel is about uh, my life in Israel. I talk about Israel, about a young woman in Israel. Always like I also, I, I have BA in economics. I'm economist in Brazil. Uh, I, I was graduated there. And I used to work international trade for many years. It looks like I used to write a... Um, studies on trade relationship between Brazil and other countries too. And uh, in all this, was tour guide is always, uh, I get inspiration about all this in my books. And also uh, I bring my books to the world and the world bring, uh, inspire me to write these books. Well, thank, thank you very much. I know you're, you're about, uh, we thank you. We're moving on to our next uh, writer, which will be Peggy. But I wish you a wonderful evening today. And thank you so much for sharing thank your time with us. I know your time is precious today. Thank you very much. I appreciate that you invite me. I'm going to see the recording about the other authors. I would like to see what they do too. But I have to go. <laughs> thank yes. you very much. If you have a question, you have my site. Yeah, yeah, you can see my books in, in the www.safefronteraspress.com. They will put there and the information. You can see all my books and, the, and um, see if you're interested in the books. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna... Okay. So our next uh, writer is, is going to be uh, Peggy Taylor. Uh, Street Reads author Peggy Taylor has been a multilingual New York City tour guide since 1981, specializing in Harlem gospel and jazz tours and working primarily, mainly for the French-owned company Harlem Spirituals. While touring, she also worked as a freelance writer for Essence and Odyssey color magazines. After that, she fell in love with photography, took courses at the International Center for Photography, attended workshops at VNH and the Apple Store. Since then, she's combined writing and photography in becoming a regular contributor to the neighborhood online paper, The West Side Rag. Before becoming a guide, Peggy lived in Paris, where she fell in love with its outdoor cafe scene, she couldn't pass an outdoor cafe without photographing it. When former Mayor de Blasio launched the open restaurants program, authorizing eateries to set up shop on sidewalks and in the street, Peggy took her iPhone 12 Pro Max and began exploring the city to see how the program was working. Peggy's explorations lasted 14 months, turned her into a tourist in her own city and gave her something creative and joyful to do while battling pandemic stress. So welcome, Peggy. Thank you very much. I will sh share my screen here. Ah, here we go. All right, so first of all, thank you, Gannick. Thank you, the Education Committee for inviting me. This is quite an honor and I really appreciate it very much. Well, thank you very much for that uh, summary. That was very good, uh, Nina. I think it's pretty clear what I was up to. And uh, so I'm starting this on page uh, 16, but actually there are 15 more pages. What's in the 15 more pages that uh, precede this? That would be my explanation for the origin of this work, why I got into this. And Nina, you alluded to it, the fact that I'm a uh, outdoor cafe addict. When I was in Paris, I would be known to walk the Champs Elysees and stop in four of them. Uh, because I just love the chairs, I love the, the, the elegance of it, I love the chicness of it, and I never quite got over that. So when Mayor de Blasio announced that we were going to have the open restaurants program, I thought, oh, this is wonderful, we're going to get many more outdoor cafes in New York City, and New York will become pa Paris on the Hudson. 
and I think it did. So here I am, I'm beginning with pictures of me just in some of the places where I went and uh, made photographs. Oh dear, I have to eliminate this. I can't find, my, oh, here it is, my other arrow. Um, I categorize these by the prettiest, the quirkiest, the riskiest, uh, the smallest, the highest, that was one of the categories. So you're seeing that here. I found uh, Fiorello's to be one of, the, one of the prettiest, especially around Christmas time when they put all the Christmas decorations and these two wonderful chandeliers here. Uh, La Grande Boucherie was just a gem of Art Nouveau decoration. That was a big hit. Um, I like the one Bergdorf Goodman, which was a big surprise. They had never had an outdoor dining set up before. Balthazar down in uh, Soho was one of my favorites. And it mimics, you know, the brasseries that you find in Paris with the burgundy colors and the gold lights. Ah, here are Fiorello's chandeliers again in this $4,000 a month tent that they, rent, that they rented. This was one of my favorites also over on the east side, Fleming, and it was one of the most Parisian. Uh, you see here the famous Parisian chairs, that, which were made by the Maison Gatti, which I actually toured the last time I was in Paris. I'm so enamored of these chairs, just look how beautiful they are, that I went and took a tour of the factory. Another thing that's interesting about this shot is that you see this restaurant in three different iterations. You see it here when it is barely sheltered by these cedar trees, and uh, but here it gets a a border, and then here in the winter, it gets a roof with electric lights. And this is something I did for several of the photos because I had a lot of time, we were all unemployed, so I was able to go back to these places several times and see how they were changing. And it's a tribute to the restaurateurs of New York, uh, how improvis uh, improvisational they were, how they adapted to new guidelines to the weather, to the seasons. They were out there just making this thing work. Uh, here, I call this the most intimate one over on 60th Street near uh, Alliance Francaise, the French Institute. But it's not really as intimate as it seems because it's next to the subway ventilation grate for the R train. So you have the R train running here on its way to Queens. Uh, this one, La Durée down in Soho, not on the street, but I still consider it a street of reason. It was one of my favorites, thought it was very beautiful. This I call the most improbable because who would have thought that a, an outdoor restaurant would survive being next to a homeless shelter, but it did. And you all know the story of this, uh, the Lucerne having been, having hosted the, uh, the homeless there and there having been quite a lot of controversy. But this lady here is completely unfazed. She's waiting for her partner and she's going to enjoy her escargot bourguignon or whatever at this French restaurant. Now this one I call the riskiest. I must say, I was just flabbergasted that the city of New York allowed this right at the beginning of the pandemic. You have uh, us out in the middle of the street between Amsterdam Avenue and between bike lanes. I mean, completely, completely unsheltered. But everybody had pretty good reflexes and the city was bound to make this work. So we did, here I am in the streetery uh, on the other side of my cheeseburger and there is the bicycle lane and the delivery guy. Another one that was pretty exposed was Harvest Kitchen. And you'll see later on that I also did three iterations of this one. Uh, here we have a playpen in the middle of the street, Amsterdam Avenue, the trucks roaring by, but New York is completely unfazed. I also, uh, I, I failed to mention this. I did this also because I thought it was of historical interest that you'd be seeing things our ways of dining that we had never seen before and that we probably will never see again, particularly as concerns eating out in the middle of the street. Uh, wraparounds, I won't belabor that too much, but I'll show an example here. 
the city permitted restaurants to not only use their frontage, but also to wrap around the corners and to set up shops in front of other storefronts if they weren't being used and if they gave their permission, which they did. There was no West Side comedy going on at that time. So Playa Bellis on Amsterdam was able to wrap around. And I show you other examples of that. Uh, the quirkiest here down in um, the meatpacking district at Budokan, you have these uh, quirky, these squiggly little tubes, which are part of the heating system. This was one of my favorites in my neighborhood, 68th and Columbus, Il Violino, which changed its streeteries according to the seasons and according to holidays. So here around Christmas time, you got Santa's Cottage. At Easter, you got Mr. and Mrs. Rabbit. Uh, here in the springtime, you got a spring cottage. That was very encouraging. And all this, you know, lifted the spirits of a stress-ridden, anxiety-ridden New Yorkers. And I appreciate, I really appreciated what the restaurants did in that regard. Uh, I went out in the snow because I just did, didn't want to show this in good weather. I went out in the snow at Jean Georges on uh, Columbus Circle. These were the fanciest ones, the most elegant. Here you have the carpets, you have the cushions, you have the candles, you have the blue to Bluetooth speakers. Once I got in one of these, I did not want to go home. It was just perfect. And here you see in the misty rain, this, um, this waiter here going from one cabin to another. Again, snowy pictures up on Amsterdam and 78th Street. New York is out, bundled up, but determined to dine al fresco, even in winter. Uh, I didn't much like the ones that were all black. In fact, I found them so depressing, but there are a few that were pretty chic. So I highlighted those. I went to Sylvia's, highlighted that as black success. And, but then I did come to these that I just hated. And I found these to be the ugliest. I call them eyesores. No, 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 no. These rusting chairs here, rusted scrape. I know this is, this is an aesthetic for some people, but it's not for me. And for me, these were a real downer. So I always look for, looking for color. Um, the smallest, these were cute ones, the smallest. This was something that uh, we would never see again, I think, and had never seen before. New Yorkers just dining next to parking meters and under street trees. Um, right on the corner of Madison Avenue, who would have thought that here, Ralph Lauren next to fire hydrants and standpipes. Give me hand sanitizer. Of course, this was ubiquitous. We saw this everywhere. And some folks did something really comical and whimsical with it. Nellos over on Madison Avenue put masks on their, uh, on their teddies. And of course, the hand sanitizer is not far away. Now, this is another one that I visited three times. So here you see the evolution of Harvest Kitchen, extremely exposed. You know, would you imagine that the city would have allowed this? And then they get a little tent. They also get these barriers, which should have sand in them to make them heavier. Sometimes you have to have about 2,000 pounds of sand for them. So they're getting a bit safer. And here they get prettier. Uh, heat, I went out. Uh, and kind of chronicled and documented the different kind of lamps, the different kind of heating setups there were. And then the highest and the lowest down uh, Pier 17, the greens, you had your little pod there. And then the lowest down on the Hudson River. We had never seen that before. The chairs spaced here, stretched all along uh, the pier at uh, Pier 1 on the Hudson. Miss that, the longest, there were some pretty long ones. Went to Little Italy, Arthur Avenue. Uh, out in Queens, not on the street, but it was a kind of street area and it was what I was looking for. Lots of colorful umbrellas to cheer me up. Uh, so here we go, give me color. So this is what I was looking for. And when I went to 95th in Amsterdam and found this Mexican restaurant, Rancho Tequileria, I was just, 
just so happy, so pleased to see that. So I gave them a lot of play. Oh, by the way, going back here. Well, no, I won't. All right, this was uh, one of the highlights here. I went up to 207, 207th Street in Inward, where I had never been before. And I come upon this waiter who I think is putting, is bringing tablecloths for these tables, but instead he is bringing uh, cloths to cover the unsightly and very drab police barricade covers. And I thought that was just extraordinary. I thought, what spirit, you know, making something cheerful and joyful out of something very barren and, and drab. So enjoyed that. I gave him a little bit more play here. This is what it looked like when I first got there. This is what I what it looked like when I left. Raices, 207th Street. Uh, that was also in uh, Inwood on Dykeman Street, where I had never been before. A lot of the places dressed themselves up with lots of greenery, which I thought was just fabulous. So I included them. More, here we have the flowers, give me four flowers. And you can see from my background, I am at this one, five stone, five milestone over on Second Avenue. Uh, Central Park South, very elaborate thing with these uh, artificial hortensias. And on Ninth Avenue, you had the Thai restaurant there with very colorful ones. This was pretty extraordinary over on Madison Avenue, 91st Street, an Italian restaurant, Vicolino. They just went all out with the full wisteria, but with this wonderful roof and this extraordinary uh, this extraordinary floral smoke of roses. It was just amazing what they did there. I have one category, first time outdoor cafes, which, is, which included um, um, Bergdorf Goodman. They had never had one before. Ralph Lauren had not had one before. He had had a cafe, but it was indoors, not outdoors. It also went wrap around, as you can see. Here people are on the curb near the fire, near the fire hydrants. Um, Chinatown got eateries, streeteries for the first time. More of Chinatown, a place in Harlem that hadn't had them before. And then there was the run on uh, wisteria, full wisteria. I said that at, just as we had had a run on toilet paper at the start of the pandemic, so we later had a run on full wisteria as a lot of these uh, streeteries vied with each other to become more beautiful. So you had the wisteria, and then it was, they all had palm fronds and showed a lot of imagination. McDonald's got into the act uh, down in Greenwich Village and I titled that Fine Outdoor Dining Under the Yellow Arches. I went to Queens. I had never been to Main Street in Flushing. Uh, this is 40th Road off Main Street. And here is what that looked like indoors. Back to Bergdorf Goodman, back to Harlem, and then Ah, the picture which is on the cover. I waited until there was a very clear night and then took my iPhone Pro Max 12 down and got this shot. Oh, well, thank you. All thank right. you. Sure. And they're bubbles, right? And the bubbles. All right, this is the last one. Uh, <laughs> on a rainy night, Bubbles at Café du Soleil, 104th and uh, Broadway. And he was actually the first one to do something so whimsical and, and it was a big success. So I really, I congratulate the city on having pulled this off. I was watching a lot of European television at the time and they were still doing takeout and delivery while we in New York were eating mussels in bubbles in the rain. Thank Voila. you so much. Bravo, bravo. So uh, Peggy, well, were there any, I know you have some Q and A's from the audience, so I'll, I'll let them, but uh, any surprising things you've, you've learned since doing this wonderful body of work? Any, any surprises or, or beliefs that you now have that you didn't have before as a result of? Well, actually the surprise is that 
blurb, which I thought would be able to issue this as an ebook, is now discontinuing its ebook platform, and which says that I am very disappointed. I managed to get these just two copies of an ebook, which I'm presenting here. And then after that, they said, we are now sunsetting that service. So I am really very disappointed about that. And so the only way to get it now is uh, in a printed version. That was my surprise and dis dismay oh. and disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> the, and how does your, in, in terms of doing this, how, how, how does your uh, touring and guiding yeah. uh, and, and photography, how does that all fit together? I know you- All right, that all, all fits around. together because once I got out over my fear of taking public, public transportation, I didn't start doing this until two months after de Blasio's announcement launching this. And once I got over that, all of my curiosity about the city, my love about the city uh, kicked in. And I just wanted to see what everybody else in, in the city was doing. I wasn't just gonna stay here on my little cocoon on the Upper West Side, but I was determined to get out and see other neighborhoods like Inwood, like Flushing, places like that. And I think having been a tour guide, I felt at ease once I got out um, because, and I had the curiosity of a tour guide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, and I, I felt like I was really touring my own city. Yeah, it's great. It's great. So are any questions, other questions? Uh, the panel? Perhaps, Nino, so, we can wait for the for questions. We'll go the back and forth. Yeah, but we okay, should really, okay, great. Uh, go over to Sheila now. So Sheila, thank great. you so much, Peggy. If you could stop sharing your screen. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Stop share. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have Sheila Evans and the author of Cathedral Parkway Towers at Harlem's Gate. Sheila Evans has written, produced, and narrated several educational audiobooks, including Literature of the Harlem Renaissance. A longtime member of the Actors Studio, she has worked on stage and film and television and narrated children's books for Trove Books and more. She's a member of SAG AFTRA and Actors Equity. Sheeler has a Master of Science degree in Education from City College of New York, CCNY, with honors, where she is on the board of directors of the Black Alumni Group. She's also the chairperson of the United Tenants Association of Cathedral Parkway Towers Incorporated. Sheila is familiar with New York City neighborhoods from the perspective of a licensed New York City tour guide and is also an international travel director. Well, thank you very much for that. While my cover is there, I don't have as many visuals as our other um, panelists, but um, that cover was done by an artist named Renee Nascimento, who also lives in the complex. Um, that is the Senate House there on the left side at the cathedral grounds. And then the background there is Tower One of the Cathedral Parkway Towers, and next to it is the Tower Two. That is Amsterdam Avenue and Cathedral Parkway, which is also known as 110th Street. Um, before we get off the cover though, I just wanna say a little bit about uh, Rene um, Nascimento. Um, he is uh, from Brazil. And so when I was listening to Betty, I was thinking about him and also about my stepmother who was also uh, from Brazil. And uh, Rene is a tenant who lives in the Cathedral Parkway Towers. Um, he's in Brazil right now working on a project and he is very well known internationally. Um, interesting story and his story is in the book. Um, he's very well known worldwide. I was interviewing him for the book in his apartment. He and his partner had invited me for brunch and it was really, you know, divine. And as I'm there, I see this picture, this painting. And I said, oh my God, that's the cover of the book. So they both agreed with me um, they uh, saw right away. I said, why is this here? He said he had uh, submitted it to the building when the building was buying um, a painting for each uh, building, for each structure, for Tower 1 and Tower 2. And this one was rejected, but they chose two other paintings of his. So he was in the game, but this one, I said, this was not selected because it was going to be the cover of my book. 
uh, Cathedral Parkway Towers at Harlem's Gate. So I asked him immediately about the rights. I was very concerned about that. Um, if I made it the cover, you know, what would happen down the road if somebody bought it? He said, oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. Well, about a year later, I see the painting in our lobby for sale. So I get very nervous and I call him right away to ask, what is the price? Well, I can't afford the price, but he promises me that don't worry, it is, you know, it's yours, you have the rights. And then about two years later, I got a call from him. He was in Brazil and he was sort of getting rid of some of his inventory. And he said, are you still interested in the painting? And I said, absolutely, because the book was not published. I mean, we're just, this is all just, you know, uh, coming together. And he said, uh, could you do half um, price? So I said, let me think about it. Yes, I can do it. <laughs> that quick, I thought I better jump on this. So um, when I told my husband, he said, okay, let me get this straight. You have bought a painting to go where I live that I've never seen. And I said, yes, I have. I said, but I, I guarantee you will love it. And if you don't love it, I'll take it to my mom's and I'll put it there. And he turned out to love it. I don't know if you're gonna see the back of it or not. Um, are we gonna show the back cover? Because there again is another uh, sort of homage to Peggy Taylor because she did the my cover picture for the back cover. Can we turn it around or not? What, what I can do is I'm gonna share the, um, the Amazon version and on that people can see the back cover because I don't have the, the, the view of the back cover here, okay? Okay. Let me stop sharing and I'll put in the chat the link to the Amazon version. Okay. Well, it's just another feather in the cap of Peggy Taylor because oh, she took that picture at a, <laughs> you know, at an outing. And um, when I was trying to decide what would be a good picture, you know, for the cover or the back, that was what I selected. So, okay. So um, are we ready for me to get started? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to, um, I've talked about Renee and the rights. And so now I want to talk about how I got started uh, with this. I have to say that everything about this book came through a divine order. Um, but the story about my book begins in Harlem. I was writing uh, about Harlem tourism for a quarterly magazine called the Harlem Torch. And I also um, would look at the magazine's other content. And I began thinking about the famous rent strike in the complex at Cathedral Parkway Towers. I'd heard so much about this rent strike, but I didn't know anything about it, except that the tenants were very proud of it. And since so many huge accomplishments do go undocumented, I decided it would make a good article. So I asked the site manager, Mrs. Willie Mae Anderson, uh, for an interview. And she explained the strike um, and how the people pulled together in such a way, it was really miraculous. I submitted the article and it was published and well-received by the management. Now that rent strike happened in 1975 after the towers opened. I was not living uh, in the complex. This happened uh, in 2010 that she and I had our meeting. So here's this lovely location directly across from the iconic Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine in a wonderful neighborhood. And yet this lovely looking structure on the outside was seriously flawed on the inside due to shoddy workmanship. There were heating problems on the inside. There were light fixture problems and a non-working intercom system for a start. So the tenants organized a rent strike and they got their demands. Um, as I said, the article was very well received and the following year, uh, Mrs. Anderson saw a small religious picture book for children that I had published for someone in Michigan. And she loved it and she bought several copies for her church 
And then she popped the question, would I write the history of Cathedral Parkway Towers beginning with the rent strike? Wow. Although I love the experience now, I have to say I regretted saying yes to that many times because the task was so difficult. I didn't know where to begin. I was given a mountain of research and newspaper clippings and just so much paper uh, from the management office because so many people had died and people were starting to forget many of the important details. So I didn't know where to start. And then after many months of really being you know, uh, baffled and a lot of constant prayers, it began to take shape in my head. And I thought, Maybe I should start with the lawyers, the developer, which all led to um, a uh, the developer was kind enough to make it easy for the complex to purchase uh, itself or the tenants to uh, to purchase it. At the end of 2011, I finally started writing officially. But now my mother was diagnosed that December with vascular dementia. So as her only child and care manager, I had to rethink my priorities. Um, my time, you know, um, being very limited because uh, some of the things I have to do for her, you know, billing and taxes and all that, they're really never done. They're just completed for a short while and then it's time to do it again. And then she has a home. so. As New Yorkers, we chose to live mainly in the apartment lifestyle where, you know, if something happens to a pipe, you call maintenance. But for my mom's home, I first have to find a plumber. And since I don't live there, I have to begin with asking around, you know, where this is headed. These, my friends, are difficult, time-consuming tasks, and they don't leave a lot of time to write a book. So... I had been teaching at the School of Visual Arts for 14 years. Um, I was teaching acting for animators. And I realized that I was gonna have to leave SVA in order to manage my mom. Um, you see, with tour guiding, we are so fortunate because of our flexibility. We can book around trips and activities and things that we're doing. And if there's an issue, we can easily replace ourselves with a colleague. But with the school, you're expected to be there you know, for the entire semester or the entire year. Um, so my mom living in Motown, that always meant traveling up to five trips a year. And my husband is from uh, Detroit as well. So I was facing more back and forth travel than ever. So I decided to leave SBA in 2012. I wish I could say that I buckled down and started writing I really still couldn't, I had too much on my plate, but I did interview approximately 30 people in our community room, that was the kickoff. And um, after that, I started and I stopped for quite a while. Um, and the truth be told, if it weren't for the pandemic, I probably still would be writing the book. Um, so it was good for something in my life because the shutdown, you know, um, during the shutdown, I did a lot of food shopping and cooking. I was part scullery maid and part author, but I was able to finish Cathedral Parkway Towers at Harlem's Gate. And I'm so grateful because one thing I will share is that once you have begun interviewing people, they start asking you, how's the book? How's it coming? What's going on? And, you know, I'm reluctant to say, you know, it's not coming right now. It's not coming. And then I had these terrible fears that I could lose it, you know, on my um, computer. I, you know, these stories where people suddenly look up and everything's gone. I was backing up things, but not everything and not all the time, you know. I would um, sometimes just forget to back up. But anyway, I lived with a lot of real terror, I have to say, for a while. And I wanted it done. I wanted it off my plate. Um, but it wasn't possible, you know, to really just do that that quickly. Anyway, um, here I am today, uh, the author of Cathedral Parkway Towers, 
um, having been asked to write it. And um, I was asked by the manager, then, you know, I, you know, sometimes you say yes. And then you think to yourself, oh, why didn't I think about it a minute? Why didn't I stop? But today I couldn't be more grateful. I'm very, very happy. And that's my presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so any questions in the Q&A or uh, is it, what uh, for Peggy, uh, we, it's what, what was interesting about your book, reading it, and I'm still reading it, it's just it, it's apartments as communities. And you created a whole community with oral histories from rent strikes to all kinds of events that happened and you expanded out into the neighborhood of Harlem and to the city. And so that's very unique. It's almost like, even though they're not visuals like Peggy's book was it's a photography book, it almost always feel like I'm in a documentary and getting a really unique slice of life. And uh, I would encourage people to read the book, but is there anything has anything changed? We're, we don't have that much time for questions, but what perspectives or beliefs uh, have have challenged your work um, after writing it? You may have had one preconception, and did anything change as a result of completing the book? Well, sir, I was relieved. Uh, that was the main thing. It was like carrying something very heavy, you know, and suddenly when it was over, um, I realized just recently I never celebrated because somebody asked, what did you do to celebrate? I haven't done that yet because you know, of what's going on with my life, but I will, believe me, I will. And the other thing is, I am certain that I'll write again because my husband used to tease me. He said um, he had never dated a girl who brought books on the date, but I would have my books because I, you know, time was important. And if he stepped away or went to pump gas or did something, then I could, you know, get a couple of pages in. And I realized that I've read, uh, you know, quite a few books. I don't write like anybody, but I mean, my favorite author, for example, um, Isabel Wilkerson uh, right now, but her book, The Warmth of Other Sons was just absolutely incredible to me. And, um, but I was also always in love with Edna St. Vincent Millay. Edgar Allan Poe, um, Charles Dickens. Um, in fact, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, I visited 22 Baker Street, which is supposed to be the home of Sherlock Holmes, you know, and uh, that's really fun. And then also the Dickens place um, and Langston Hughes place right on 127th Street. Um, there's so many authors that really touched me. Um, Nella Larson, recently one of her pieces was um, turned into uh, the film Passing. Um, SAG had it up, everybody was looking mm -hmm. at it. And she was a fascinating person. She was born to write. She was the daughter of a black man and a Danish mother. When she was two years old, her uh, father died and her mother remarried a Dane. So she grew up in a family as the only black related by blood. To an all white family. <laughs> it's a very interesting, you know, um, circumstance. And I think there is a certain uh, depth to that comes from, uh, from that kind of living. And it, it shows up in your writing. Oh. Oh, thank, thank you, Peggy. Do we, I don't know what our time I'm is. Sheila. <laughs> Sheila. I mean, Sheila. <laughs> yeah, okay. Who's sure Sheila? Yeah. Um, do we have time for questions or what's our time like? Uh, but uh, so you mentioned with tour guiding and writing, how does that feed into your work as you can see while I'm reading your book that you, you set it up in New York City in a neighborhood, but. Well, I guess um, location is very important to tour guides. And in a way we're all telling stories, we're storytellers in that, you know, we may be telling the story of the Chrysler building or we may, may be telling a story of Grand Central, but to engage very often our groups, you know, um, 
we put it in a way we kind of, I think, think like that. In fact, I think tour guides think differently uh, from anybody else. And that's all over the globe. I mean, I have interviewed tour guides in other countries. And while we're all unique because of DNA, there's a process that we share somehow in our thinking patterns, you know? So I'd say that guiding informed everything I wrote because first things first, I had to set it up in the location, set up the iconic cathedral, talk about that. That's, you know, a book all by itself. And then I had to think about the neighborhood, you know, the, the various shops, the Hungarian pastry shop, which is also iconic in its own way. Everybody finds a way up there. Um, and I thought about the transportation and the fact that Cathedral Parkway Towers has the red line at Broadway and then it has the blue uh, line and the orange line at uh, Manhattan Avenue. So when you think about that, you know, you're in great, you know, a great position. Three parks, Riverside Park, Morningside Park, Central Park, all within walking distance. And believe it or not, I mean, with the schools, Columbia Union, you know, all of those um, schools in the neighborhood, a lot of people, a lot of the tenants were not aware of any of this. Because as guides, again, we sort of see the world differently. We get out and we do it. We're out and about, you know. And um, there are many people who live here, I found during the interviews, who have never been inside the cathedral because they're not Anglican, you know, and there's that feeling you got to be Anglican, you know, to go in there. So I think that um, guiding informed, you know, a lot, at least 30 percent, you know, of the book. Um, it was important where other people were coming from who were helping Central Harlem, you know, uh, Queens, you know. We had people coming from the other boroughs that helped to help this win. It was a big victory. And uh, I understand why Mrs. Anderson wanted it, you know, a chronicled. Um, it is a great history uh, lesson for anybody moving in. That was really what they wanted. They wanted the new people as older people die out. Now, I remind you that a lot of people who were children during that rent strike are now grownups and have their own apartments. You know, so they're here. It's a middle income. So that makes it fascinating too. I thought about Jacob Reese and I, you know, put him in the book because he really kind of started this about looking at housing. So this is um, affordable housing. So there was always lots of low income, always lots of high Fifth Avenue luxury, but not nothing for the middle income person until uh, Mitchell Lama. Um, to people, um, Senator Mitchell and uh, Assemblyman Lama brought this forward in the 50s. And as we know, very often urban renewal led to black removal and poor removal. And people had gotten hit to that. And they were like, no, one, we don't want that. And so it became with these Mitchell Lamas that as they went up, you had to include people in the area, people in the neighborhood. So there are people who live in this complex who were actually born on this site when it was women's hospital. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Sheila. Um, we could, uh, we would love to listen. One, everybody's commenting on what a wonderful voice you have that it really lends itself to audiobooks. And so, um, but uh, we do need to unfortunately start wrapping this up. And I do think that like the tour guiding that you're talking about, it's really wonderful to see the diversity of this panel because it's different audiences and different approaches. So, you know, children's books and thinking about young adults, people coming from outside, you know, a different country like Brazil, uh, but feeling at home also in New York City, with the community that you're talking about and recovering a past and just the community of a particular apartment building. And then this very unique historical moment for Sheila where she's talking and using, so you have oral history, you have children's literature, you have uh, sort of visual history. It's all really great to see all these different approaches. Just very quickly, Sheila, there's so many questions that had been, uh, I'm sorry, Peggy, so many questions that people were asking, but I think to summarize what the people's uh, curiosity is, is what is the status of streeteries now? What right now and post sort of one foot in COVID still one foot out. Yeah. And then I think we'll have to end it there. 
Okay, well, the majority of New Yorkers are in favor of streeteries, but there are some neighborhoods, for example, down in uh, Alphabet City and also in the in Greenwich Village, East Village, where the streets are narrower, uh, the the, the places are louder, there seem to be more rats. This is what people are complaining about. And so they want to put some restrictions on this. And the Department of Transportation is trying to come to some compromise. Everybody wants to keep them, but keep them in better condition. They want the owners, if they're not using them anymore, to demolish them and not uh, just let them stay out there and attract the rats. So uh, the Department of transportation is planning to get rid of those huge streeteries, you know, the huge sheds, but to leave, uh, leave space for the others, but with lower barriers. But they, they will continue because we've got a new variant on our hands. And so people are still asking to eat outdoors. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much, ladies. This was a really great presentation. And it's so great to see how much talent there is uh, out there and sharing it in these different ways. Um, Emma? Okay, thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much, Nina, for moderating the discussion. And many, many thanks to Peggy, to Sheila, and to Betty, who's um, off to the theater, I believe. Um, so thank you, ladies, so much for really sharing your wonderful books, your wonderful talents. Uh, like Kevin said, it's great to see. We've got such a depth here in GANIC. So it's really, uh, it makes, um, you know, it makes us such a special organization. So thank you, ladies, very, very much. It was really thank wonderful. You, thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, you for having us. This is so wonderful. What I'm going to do, ladies, I'm actually going to put you as attendees now as we're going through our the next part. Nina will be doing her presentation. So you all will become attendees, but you can read the chat. And so if anyone has more questions for Sheila or Peggy, please put them in the chat. Remember to address them to everyone. And that way they can see that and you can reply right there. So thank you again, ladies. This was really a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I can't wait to see you all again very soon. So yeah, so don't worry if you just disappear off the screen, you're still, um, you're still in, in the meeting. Okay. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot. Thank All right, you. so Nina, um, you're up. Nina, you're up. Um, no, I'm sorry. We've got a report from Destination Capitol Hill. So actually, let me get Harvey. I'm going to bring him onto the screen. Um, so he will be speaking and giving us a um, giving us information about Destination Capitol Hill. So Harvey, when you're ready, take it away. And thanks again, ladies. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're just waiting on Harvey to come in. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you, Harvey. Welcome. Good. Welcome. Well, Destination Capitol Hill is a, an annual event that's sponsored by the United States Travel Association, and uh, they do it every year. And the idea is to bring everyone that they can, representing different organizations within travel and tourism, to come and, and lobby with the legislators, uh, the congressmen and women and senators in, in Congress. And so the opening reception the first night, uh, I thought was poorly attended because it was, it was different. They had a headquarters hotel, which you were supposed to go to to register by five o'clock that evening and then go to a different venue for the reception. And so a number of people that did show up at the reception uh, didn't have name tags because they didn't know they were supposed to go to the, uh, the hotel first to, to register. At any rate, uh, Patrick, Kit, and I were able to take advantage of the situation by meeting with uh, Tori Bonds, who was one of the executive vice presidents of the association. Uh, Roger Dow, who is the current president and CEO, is going to be retiring in June. And it's thought that uh, the Tori would probably be his, his uh, successor. And so we cornered her and did a presentation about wanting to be part of the association. We're not actually members. We're members of Brand USA, which is the marketing arm of USTA, uh, but we're not members of the association it's itself. And so Patrick is gonna follow up on that with, with Tory Bonds to see how we can become a member. Hopefully there'll be strategic affiliation where no money uh, is exchanged. At any rate, the next day, the meeting started with an orientation and uh, an award was given to retiring Senator Blunt, a Republican from Illinois, for all the time and effort he spent uh, promoting tourism uh, and, and travel. Uh, then we had a panel come on who uh, of USTA executives 
who talked about the aims of this particular event. The first one was rebuilding the workforce. The second was reigniting in persons business in-person business meetings and events. And the third one was reimagining the role of travel and tourism in improving global competitiveness. Now we sat in tables in the room by state. And uh, since I live in New Jersey, uh, I was assigned to the New Jersey state table, even though I listed Gannick as my organization with its New York address. And uh, we formed a team of several people from New Jersey. Uh, one member of the team uh, was the uh, president of New Jersey Tourism, another member represented uh, Wyndham Hotels, and a third member represented uh, the Newark Convention and Visitor Bureau. And we talked about strategy among ourselves uh, and where our destination was gonna be. We were not gonna stay in the hotel, but we were going to Capitol Hill where the representatives had their offices. And due to everything that's happening in Washington, we were assigned a, a townhouse, not their actual office where we, we met. And uh, we were assigned uh, several New Jersey representatives, congressmen and congresswomen. Uh, some two of them actually met with us in person. The others were virtual meetings. Uh, we had meetings with uh, the staff of Senator Menendez and uh, Senator Booker didn't respond at all to a virtual meeting or an in-person meeting. At any rate, I, at my meeting, I was talking about Gannick and I explained why I, I was being with a New York, rather a New Jersey organization and representing, or living in New Jersey rather, and representing a New York organization. And I stated that a number of our guides lived in New Jersey and we were affected by the pandemic and guides were out of work. So that seemed to hit, hit home with the people that we were speaking with. I think it was a valid point. Uh, it was also found interesting that the, the people we spoke to didn't realize that tourism is an export. And we explained in, in our group how tourism contributes to the balance of trade you know, with, with imports and how important it is. And uh, one of the staff that we spoke to didn't seem to realize that tourism, international tourism in particular, is, is an export. Um, and what else, what else did we happen? Okay. We also talk another interesting point was we, we brought up the fact that competitive countries, as far as tourism is concerned, usually have a a secretary or a commissioner of tourism, a minister of tourism, and the United States does not have this position. So all the different aspects of tourism are spread out within different departments. And part of our pitch was that the United States should have someone reporting to the secretary of, of commerce that can coordinate all the various departments involved with tourism, department of transportation, department of health, you know, visas, everything else, because now it's all spread out and no one has really control over everything. So in essence, uh, there was one other thing we talked about masking and uh, the US Travel Association is in much in favor of having masks being removed in instances. And we got sort of a mixture, at least I did in my group and I'll let Patrick explain in his group, his comments, that people weren't always that concerned with eliminating masks. They thought that masks should still be necessary. So that was sort of a difference of opinion between the US Travel Association and some of the representatives that we met with. All in all, I feel that the event was very successful and it's something we should continue to do. And hopefully we'll be part of the association in some form or other in the future. And any questions? Well, I'd like to give a little bit from the New York side as well. Uh, it certainly is worth noting that we made up quite a team on the New York end. With myself, we had two representatives from Long Island, uh, visit Long Island. Jamie Claudio and Susan Leno, Kit Garrett also on the New York team, and for a couple of our meetings, Fred Dixon, a name, of course, you all know from uh, NYC and company. I have to give quite a shout out uh, to most of the New York representatives who uh, set up meetings with us. Uh, Chuck Schumer, of course, has always been a friend of the travel industry. Three of his staff met with the New York State, met with everybody from New York State. Kristen Gillibrand, uh, had to do it by Zoom, so we did the townhouse thing. But again, her legislative aide was there with us. Uh, new kid on the block. Now, he's Long Island representative, Andrew Gar Garbarino. Now, okay, a lot of you know I'm a flamethrowing liberal. I tend to go my arch my back when I'm dealing with Republicans. But he was probably the single most enthusiastic welcome that um, our Destination Capital Hill team received. He was fascinated by all of this. This was all new to him, the extent of 
travel and what it means to his locality. And he's already signed on and supported uh, some of the visa, the visa reform aspects of this year's agenda. So that counts as a real win for us. Uh, Lee Zeldin, also Long Island, uh, met with us. Grace Ming uh, here in New York met with us and a digital uh, a Zoom session with Carolyn Maloney's representatives. Unfortunately, we did not get Representative Bowman and Representative Nadler. Uh, they did not confirm their dates. What was um, really interesting, you would think that everybody in the Senate would be aware of it, but neither of our New York senators were aware of the bill that Harvey described, uh, the reimagining role of uh, tour and tourism in improving global competitiveness. To drill down on that a little bit, this is huge. We are talking about an office of tourism and travel that will rise to the upper levels of the Commerce Department. It will make it, in effect, a cabinet level position. And I know you're all gonna, gonna get a, a giggle out of the name, the bill is actually rather long-windedly referred to as the Omnibus Travel and Tourism Act of 2021. It's known colloquially as the Tour Bus Act. <laughs> and um, to follow up on what Harvey referred to in meeting with uh, Executive Vice President Tory Barnes, not only for Gannick, but we're also, we also made the pitch that, and you've all heard this before, tour guides, are the foot soldiers in the tourism industry. And we're the first ambassadors that visitors will see for the first time, or will, will be the Americans that foreign visitors will deal with at any great length. We want more recognition and we want to participate in the greater travel scene. So what we're talking about is actually establishing a category of membership with US travel uh, that will include the guide associations, most of which are not for profit. So let's bring that, um, that membership rate down or eliminate it entirely and bring more of the guides on board. That was a, a great conversation to have with her because of a rather poor, poorly organized cocktail hour. So, you know, when you get lemons, you make lemonade. And um, yeah, Harvey's point was very interesting. It kind of divided the delegation about the masks, um, but what everyone was um, on board with was the dropping of the testing requirements for travelers already vaccinated. And that's the big deal. If you're already vaccinated, drop the pre-flight uh, pre travel uh, testing requirement. That had huge support from everybody. And pretty much all the uh, members of the staff were in favor of that. Oh yeah, we did get one piece of good news as soon as we landed. Our brand USA for the first time in five years is now fully funded. So all this money has finally been released by the federal government and it's part of the budget and it's going out and the glories of travel to the United States are, are going to be exploited globally. And we are going to be the, the beneficiaries of that. And I'm just looking at my notes to make sure that I've covered all the top notes. I think that is good for the top notes. So it's always fun going to DC. It is always fun sitting at the grown-ups table, so to speak. Uh, but it reminds everybody that the guides are also the grown-ups in the room, and we can tell you which room to go to. So thanks, everybody. It was great, and looking forward to it again next year. Uh, any questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A. Yes, thank you so much, Patrick and Harvey. I think that's really great, and I love that you, um, you're cornering U.S. travel people and cornering our Congress critters and getting them to think about tour guides, too in a whole new way. And um, yeah, I'm really glad. And I'm thank you, Harvey, for speaking up on behalf of Jersey. You know, we're, we're part of this too. And really great work, Patrick, with the New York delegation. So thank you both very much for updating us. If everyone could please put, um, <clears throat> put your questions and comments in the chat. And yes, Kevin, you're right. Uh, <laughs> Patrick, Harvey, and Kit, that's like the most grown up of the grown-ups. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you guys very, very much. I really appreciate that. So Harvey, I'm going to make you an attendee right now while I'm, but you'll still be able to see everything in the chat. Again, please remember to put the comments into everyone. That way everyone can see them. And so Nina, you're the first up for our um, education for our committee report. So thank you again, Harvey and um, Patrick. So take it away, Nina. Yes. I, I just want to thank uh, Kevin Lawrence for really 
pitching in and really organizing a lot of the technical background for the guest speakers. Once again, thanking uh, Betty and, and Sheila and Peggy for their great work. And I just want to say that uh, coincidence, we reached out to another guide. Uh, we wanted to do a panel of four. I, I could see that it might have been too much, but uh, pay, um, Jacqueline Goosens uh, just did a, a book this year, New York, A Photographic Journey. So we reached out to her. She wasn't able to do it, but just a plug for another woman who is writing. And also we coming to our attention, Lori Lewis has a book, New York City First. And that just came out in April. So we had sort of an extension of women's women's work, you know, Women's History Month in April with all the great work that women are doing in Gannick. Uh, just upcoming April and May fam tours, just a quickie, uh, April 16th Broadway Theater District tour with Prudence Holmes, April 20th uh, Invasion of the Street Artists with Jeremy Wilcox, uh, April 22nd day trip to Philadelphia with Nick Seth Kovic, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name, April 23rd, Discover the Secrets of Penn Station and Grand Central with Ryan Reel, and, and May 7th, Discover Subway Secrets underneath Lower Manhattan with Ryan Reel, and virtual fam tour at 2 p.m. behind the bright lights, the fabulous Broadway theaters with Anthony W. Robbins, another great Gannick author, wrote so many books, uh, and May 10th, a new offer coming to the fore. Um, this is uh, author Patrick Bringley, and it's uh, from 11 to 1, Walk with the Met with a former museum guard. We're going to have a, a education meeting. We have a monthly education meeting. It's on Zoom, so if you want to attend, just let us know, and that's going to be on April 20th. And I think Bob Gelber is working very hard at work uh, getting the guest speakers lined up and fam tours lined up for the uh, meeting in May uh, at, on Roosevelt Island. And uh, that that's about it. If you look at our minutes, we always we have a whole list of people in the education committee and honorary members. And we've added Guiding Spirit Harvey Davidson, I'm an honorary member. And and Andrew Coyle is now core Emeritus Honorary Member. <laughs> and uh, our members so far are, are Bob Yelber, Eileen Rock, Jeremy Wilcox, John Semlek, Kevin Lawrence, Lisa Puccio, Minna Sharp, and Susan Birnbaum. And uh, meeting contributors in the past have been Maggie Brown and Kit Garrett. So thank you all. And if anyone wants to jump in with any other speaker updates, feel free. Great, thank you, Nina. Thank you, everyone. Yes, and please um, drop any comments or questions into the chat. Um, so next we have Patrick Casey reporting on behalf of Government Relations, different from Destination Capitol Hill. And Nina, thank you for all your work tonight. I'm going to put you as an attendee right now, okay? So thank, thank you so much. All righty, like I'm lobbying Congress people again. Hi, we have a big ask for you all from the Government Relations Committee. Uh, there will be, even as I speak, we'll be posting on Gannick's social media, the NYC Tour Guides page on Facebook, the Gannick Members Only Facebook page, and you will see it tomorrow uh, in your email box as an announcement from Gannick. We've created a template uh, for all of our members to use to write to Council Member Justin Brannan. Uh, Justin, long story short, um, the Speaker of the New York City Council, uh, has given Justin Brannan the responsibility to reintroduce 289A. Uh, that is the uh, bill, the initiative, it's not a bill, it's an initiative that'll put guides back on the double-decker buses. And he hasn't done that yet. We have to prod him to do it. Uh, this is especially important, especially to any Gannick members that live in Mr. Brannan's district, District 43. It's Bay Ridge, Diker Heights, Bensonhurst and Bath Beach. Now, one of our organic members in Bay Ridge has responded. Tony Montione has already reached out to, uh, to member Bran uh, Brannon, but we haven't heard back yet. So now we're asking all of you to pile on. There'll be a temp, the template will be posted. Try to personalize it in any way if you can, especially if you are in his district. Tweak it a bit, uh, refer to yourselves if you are members of Gannick. If you're not a member of Gannick, please take that phrase out. But the idea is we've got to start pushing this through. The tourist season is here, as Emma uh, articulated in her president's message. 
And you know, we do all these other efforts to support tourism. We've got to get, uh, as tourist workers, we've got to be supported. So take advantage of this template being posted tonight and tomorrow morning, get it to Mr. Brannon. Let's get this introduced because we can't line up any other council members until this bill is reintroduced and renumbered. We need that renumbering to focus our energies. And again, if you're in District 43, please, if you have any questions, email me at governmentrelationsorganic.org. You will hear back from me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Um, actually, Susan just mentioned that Brandon is having eye surgery. So perhaps he's had eye surgery. He's had COVID. I get it. We're all busy. We're all sick. Get over it. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, I know, and I feel for my right. cataract surgery. I get it. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, and so we we need to get on this again, and I think this is something. Yeah, it's a little Sisyphean that we keep the ball keeps rolling. Now we keep pushing it up, but we're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna do our best. And um, so yes, yeah, so please be in touch with Patrick if you have any um, questions or any you need any detailed information about um, who to contact and how to contact um, those people. So what I'm going to do now for our last presenter, we have Dave Gardner, who's going to speak about the newsletter. Um, let me just promote him to our panelist. And when Dave's here, we'll hear from him. Unfortunately, I don't have the actual newsletter yet, because otherwise I'd be waving um, on screen for all of us. So here we are. Okay, so Dave, when you're ready, um, take it away. Can you see me? There we go. Yeah, we can see you. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you, everybody. Let me just uh, make this up. Okay, so uh, tonight is the night we discuss and unveil our latest issue of guidelines. It is for us, from us, to us, and by us. And uh, this has been the um, work of uh, several months now. So the next deadline, I know you'll, know you'll ask, is actually a bit uh, sooner than usual this time. It'll be the end of this month, April 29th, the day that Jerry Seinfeld, New Yorker born in Brooklyn, is 68. And uh, as for it itself, oh, look, who's on the cover there? That's Harvey now. And uh, I had no idea how the meeting would go tonight. And I didn't know that we would also be mentioning straighters, for example. But uh, this is uh, tour reviews, tour issues, tour events, and uh, of course our uh, president herself writing in, of course. <laughs> so, and where's my uh, little uh, thing? Oh, there it is, okay. So uh, anyway, this is it. And as usual, this is not compulsory with your, um, with your membership because many people opt not to get it. So you must write in to Linda and ask her to put you on the mailing list. And I'll post the email, although Emma usually does too, but between this, the two of us, we'll have the email for it. And I do must have to thank Linda. She is a super double terrific extra help in putting this together. This would not have helped without her. If I'm the mother of this, of this she is without a doubt the father. So, uh, this will be, uh, have you, it was a little uh, close though, Emma, this time. Did you get yours in the post? The I, haven't, I haven't received mine in the post just yet, but I'm looking forward to it. So yeah, like David said, if you, Dave said, if you want to get a hard copy of it, you can just email him at newsletter at gannick.org. Um, yeah, Matt just got his in, his in yesterday's mail. Um, so I'm sure it's going to arrive probably tomorrow morning and then I'll you know, I'll finally have my, I'll have my, um, my hard copy, but of course you can also get it online. So you can get all our newsletters are posted online and there you can see it in a PDF format with color images as well, which makes it a lot of fun. So if you have, um, like Dave said, this is by us and for us. So if you have any news, if you have anything fun to share with other guides, if you want to write a review of a tour or a venue, um, you can just um, send it right to, um, to Dave and to newsletter at um, Gannick.org, and then you can um, then you can see there we are media moguls that is right there, um, so yeah, you can see like... what's published and um, you know really enjoy it. it's a it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun so the PDF you can get that from the Gannick website if you go onto the Gannick website once you're logged in if you go into the section that's members um, that's got the documents 
it's it's posted in all the documents. It's right there. So as soon as um, Dave sends um, IT the PDF, Mark Landman posts it and it's put right there. So you can see it like it's usually in a couple of days after it's arriving by mail. It's in, in in the emails as well. OK, so thank you very much, thank Dave. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Oh, you're uh, welcome. And everybody who pitched into this and everybody who will be reading it. Yep. Yep. So yeah, please, please, um, please participate if you are if you are interested, if you would like to. So um, thank you, Dave. Um, if you have any um, any more comments, any more, and Dave, I'm going to put you as um, attendee now. All right. So thank you very much for for popping in. Though we don't, I, we miss the running entrance when it's on Zoom. We don't have that. All right. Thank you, Dave. So um, yeah. So that's that's really it. Any other business, anything people need to bring up, you can put that in the chat. Do we have anything from the board members in attendance? Um, Beth, Kit, and Jeremy could not make it tonight, but they do send their regards to everyone. So I think that's it. I think I think we're- um, And Jonathan. Oh, and Jonathan, yes, of course, and Jonathan Tour. Sorry about that. I'm like counting the squares. I miscounted. Yes. So John Samlack's making a move to adjourn. And I think there's the can I get a second second from Matt Baker? So I think we're all set. So thank you all very much for coming. You can watch this um, online. The video will be posted in the next couple of days or so. Um, yes, thank you, Dave and Linda, for your hard work with the newsletter. We really, really appreciate that. And so I wish everyone a very um, lovely evening. Enjoy this beautiful spring weather, and we'll see you in a couple more weeks on Roosevelt Island, um, May 11th. Okay, that'll be our next meeting. So bye, everyone. Have a great night, you guys. Thanks so much for coming, and we'll see you all soon. Bye now.